I cook with my heart on the plate in the pan with bright blue eyes and blue heat through all seasons all seasonings around the menu and mise en scène mise en place over the wine of listening and nourishing I will pour into each spirit at the table through the poetry I will pair with dessert inside each eyeful and mouthful of love I will make and we will taste and savor together welcome to the latest floating poetry broadcast and thank you for leaning in to the 65th show in my ongoing weekly series coming to you live from the well-salted seaside of Long Island from the historic district of Long Beach, New York whose sandy roots tr reach back to 1643. As the 1900s began, it became a thriving summer resort colony. This is your poet and poetorialist Colin Goedeke, a voice for living our days more poetically, more expressively, more soulfully, and more gratefully, as I am right now, as I sound out and into your ears from Casa Wu, the many-roomed, red-tile-roofed, Spanish Revival old villa, the spirited home of dear friends and devoted supporters, Roger and Irvy Wu, hosting me here by the ocean. Well, last week, those of us who were here last week, uh, we ventured out into the wind and the rain, viscerally and lyrically, with many senses, frontal to subtle. This week, we're going to indulge together in all kinds of love and appreciation of food, cooking, and feasting, poetically speaking. This is part one of several other edible broadcasts I plan to create and bring you live later this year. So, if you're ready to sit down or sit back, maybe with a splash of wine and savor, an a la carte menu of thoughts and commentary, poetry, and musings I've cooked up for us. Let's begin. I do have a few questions for you, as I sometimes do, for us as we begin, as we come to this table, uh, a latest table of exploration, energy, and discovery, shared discovery. What do you love most about food? About cooking? about eating, about feasting. What are your favorite memories? What other deep emotions or sensations have you had around them? In your childhood, in your adulthood or nowhood, in your daydreaming? And what aspects of any of them are you especially passionate about and why? So. Maybe things to percolate on as we, as we spend some time together. Uh, I felt we ought to start uh, with uh, Michael Pollan how, about how cooking civilized us. And uh, his book, Michael Pollan, is, the book is Cooked. He's written a number of them. I thought we'd lead in with that. So in 2006, he penned what became the most important food politics book of the past half century. Uh, maybe you've read it, actually. He traces the age-old roots of our culinary voyeurism, lingering over the nostalgic memories of watching his mother cook as he considers the narrative arc of cooking. So here he is. In ancient Greece, the word for, quote, cook, quote, butcher, and, quote, priest was the sid butter and an aromatic gust of herbs. But watching an everyday pan of eggs get scrambled was nearly as riveting a spectacle. Um as the slimy yellow goop suddenly leapt into the and an end. Later in it, he says, according to the, quote, cooking hypothesis, the advent of cooked food altered the course of human evolution by providing our forebears with a more energy-dense and easy-to-digest diet. It allowed our brains to grow bigger, brains being notorious energy guzzlers, and our guts to shrink. It seems that raw food takes much more time and energy to chew and digest, which is why other primates our size carry around substantially larger digestive tracts and spend many more of their waking hours chewing. 
as much as six hours a day. Cooking, in effect, took part of the work of chewing and digestion and performed it for us outside of the body, using outsourced sources of energy. And since cooking detoxifies many potential sources of food, the new technology cracked open a treasure trove of calories unavailable to other animals, freed from the necessity of spending our days gathering large quantities of raw food and then chewing and chewing it, humans could now devote their time and their metabolic resources to other purposes like creating a culture. Cooking gave us not just the meal, but also the occasion, the practice of eating together at an appointed time and place. This was something new under the sun, for the forager of raw food would have likely fed himself on the go and alone, like all the other animals. But sitting down to common meals, making eye contact, sharing food, and exercising self-restraint all served to civilize us. What Winston Churchill once said of architecture, quote, first we shape our buildings, and then they shape us, might also be said of cooking. First we cooked our food, and then our food cooked us. Thank you, Michael Pollan. Very interesting read. I encourage you to read that if you're interested. Um, uh, on that spoonful of actually Churchill's um, quote or thought, I summed up some uh, other food and cooking quotes I thought were delightful. Felt you you might enjoy them. W. C. Fields, the old comedian, I cook with wine. Sometimes I even add it to the food. Virginia Woolf, one cannot think well, love well, sleep well if one has not dined well. Anthony Bourdain, and we'll hear more from him later, the way you make an omelet reveals your character. How about that? Sophia Loren, uh, everything you see, I owe to spaghetti. Uh, Briat Savarin, Tell me what you eat, and I will tell you what you are. André Simon, cookery is a wholly unselfish art. All good cooks, like all great artists, must have an audience worth cooking for. Rightly said. Uh, Russian proverb, love and eggs are best when they are fresh. Uh, Julia Child, if you're afraid of butter, use cream. Uh, Alain Ducasse, great uh, chef, restaurateur. Cuisine has become too complicated. This is about subject, verb, adjective. Duck, turnips, sauce. Like that. Uh, Polish proverb. Fish, to taste right, must swim three times. In water, in butter, and in wine. Uh, Irma Bombeck. I come from a family where gravy is considered a beverage. <laughs> Julia Chubb, one more time. I think every woman should have a blowtorch. How about that? What would happen if every woman had one? And the last uh, for the moment, Federico Fellini. Life is a combination of magic and pasta. <laughs> well, following Fellini's uh, and pasta thought and pasta and La Cucina Italiana is an Easter poem of, of mine from 2005 during my married life with an amazing uh, wife and family of Italians. Uh, we would host Easter at our place, and um, there would be the ritual uh, gnocchi making and eating. And my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law was a master gnocchi maker. So always fascinating to watch her do that with my wife in the kitchen. Gnocchi for four hands. Like a nocturne or étude, the fine-boned wrists and fingers of my wife's hands and her mother's hands finesse with familiar ease and grace the ivory dough to make the Easter gnocchi. One hundred and forty-three years of melodies flowing together, rolling out and flowering together this lovely composition in our sun-bulbed kitchen the afternoon before another Buona Pasqua. Gnocchi for four hands feel, as many, I think, would, that many foods um, deserve their own odes, their own uh, honorings, homages, including creatures of the land, air, and sea uh, that land on our plates, in our mouths, in our bellies. So a perennial favorite of mine, um, Galway Canal, wrote this poem about blackberry eating. He lived from 27 to 2014. Wonderful poet. I love to go out in late September among the fat, overripe, icy black blackberries to eat blackberries for breakfast. Their stalks very prickly, a penalty they earn for knowing the black art of blackberry making. And as I stand among them, lifting the stalks to my mouth, 
The ripest berries fall almost unbidden to my tongue. As words sometimes do, certain peculiar words like strengths or squinched, many lettered, one syllabled lumps which I squeeze, squinch open, and splurge well in the silent, startled, icy, black language of blackberry eating in late September. Which led me to a poem that and reminded me of poems of pies and baking and times I made eight weighted them in some form, like out on the Olympic Peninsula on Port Townsend, Washington, one August of 2010. A poem uh, I wrote for my then uh, magical uh, daughter-in-law, Elise Garling. It's called The Pie Maker. She was a wonderful pie maker. With pounds of plump blackberries picked together after our sale, and dozens of transparents plucked from your brother's orchard, Nash's freshly ground flour, honest butter and ice water, you work your pie-making magic in the oven-warm heart of your grandmother's kitchen, and soon serve up to us, seventeen minutes sitting, slices of fragrant fruited wonder with large scoops of love and sun, so I was thinking about the, um, the great power of scent, the probably one of the strongest of all scent, scent memories, and how the aromas like um, bread baking, for example, uh, can take us instantly to many places, uh, childhood, other time, parts of our life, elsewhere. This is um, back in the Yucatan one winter. 2002. It's called Romero, Rosemary. A sudden and quite surprising scent of rosemary spikes the air, leading me straight from here, from tropical beach and sea, to roast lamb and loins of pork, potatoes, and my home on Central Park. Um, there's a book, uh, one of several of theirs, uh, by the from the uh, restaurant of the same name, Chez Panis out in uh, California. It's a book on vegetables. Um, and since it's fresh corn season, uh, and this is the, they do it by seasons, the book, I thought we'd have a note, uh, bow to corn. The first sw fresh sweet ears of summer's corn crop reach us in June from farmers in Southern California, they say in the book. We use fresh sweet corn for a myriad of preparations. Corn soup, corn souffles, corn custards, corn salads. We combine corn with other summer vegetables to make succotash, we make corn and pepper relish and a relish for salmon with corn kernels, red onion, chervil, parsley, cucumbers, and olive oil. How delicious does that sound? Wouldn't you like to be there right now having that? I, I would. I'd go there in a moment. If we could teleport ourselves, I'd go. Um, so these, these touchstones uh, that we have, whether it's by scent or sight or just you know, t uh, taste, um, we might say tongue stones, perhaps. Maybe if I could coin that set of touchstones. Uh, Pablo Neruda has done many odes to many things, from socks to you name it. And um, he did one, an ode to a lemon, which is quite beautiful. I'd like to share that. Out of lemon flowers loosed on the moonlight, love's lashed and insatiable essences, sodden with fragrance, the lemon tree's yellow emerges. The lemons move down from the trees, planetarium, Delicate merchandise. The harbors are big with it. Bazaars for the light and the barbarous gold. We open the halves of a miracle and a clotting of acids brims into the starry divisions. Creations, originals, juices, irreducible, changeless, alive. So the freshness lives on in a lemon, in the sweet-smelling house of the rind. The proportions are cane and acerb. Cutting the lemon, the knife leaves a little cathedral, alcoves unguessed by the eye that open a sigillous glass to the light, topazes riding the droplets, alters aromatic facades. So while the hand holds the cut of the lemon, half a world on a trencher, the gold of the universe wells to your touch, a cup yellow with miracles, a breast and a nipple perfuming the earth, a flashing made fruitage, the diminutive fire of a planet. Thank you, Neruda. William Carlos Williams has this one. This is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. Um, 
Let's think back, all of us, uh, on the restaurants, the bistros, tortillas, cafes, and we, you, loved somewhere, were welcomed at, maybe as a regular at, or just wildly enjoyed once upon a time. Uh, here's one of mine, uh, as I mused about it back in time in New York City in the summer of 2001, even though all of that experience went earlier. It's called The Table at Union Square, where conversations were served and feelings unfolded like linen napkins onto our laps, where laughter and tears poured like wine and sparkling water. That that table for two up the stairs, on the small balcony, overlooking bacchanalian revels across the grape-clustered wall, overhearing the happy din of diners below, all the while being looked at through lithe legs by the upside, di- upside down gaze of the ruffle-dressed woman acrobatting inside her frame. The favorite table where friends or lovers and I sat, eyes embracing eyes, over supper and sometimes long lunches, always with ice cream bottles of aqua di neppi and salty black raindrops of niçoise olives. The table I want to remember forever down at Union Square. From 1955 is Amy Lowell's wonderful poem. Um, It's so visual, tactile, so edible in its way. It's Thompson's Lunchroom, Grand Central Station. Study in white, wax white, floor, ceiling, walls, ivory shadows over the pavement, polished cream surfaces by constant sweeping. The big room is colored like the petals of a great magnolia and has a patina of flower bloom which makes it shine dimly under the electric lamps. Chairs are ranged in rows like sepia seeds, waiting fulfillment. The chalk-white spot of a cook's cap moves unglossily against the vaguely bright wall, dull chalk-white striking the retina like a blow through the wavering uncertainty of steam. Vitreous white of glasses with green reflections, ice-green carboys shifting, greener, bluer, with the jar of moving water. Jagged green-white bowls of pressed glass rearing snow peaks of chipped sugar above the lighthouse-shaped casters of gray pepper and gray-white salt. Gray-white placards, oyster stew, corned beef hash, frankfurters. Marble slabs veined with words in meandering lines. Dropping on the white counter like horn notes through a web of violins, the flat yellow lights of oranges, the cube-red splashes of apples in high plated ape pounds. The electric clock jerks every half minute. Coming. Passed. Three beefsteaks and a chicken pie. Balled through a slide while the clock jerks heavily. A man carries a china mug of coffee to a distant chair. Two rice puddings and a salmon salad are pushed over the counter. The unfulfilled chairs open to receive them. A spoon falls upon the floor with the impact of metal striking stone, and the sound throws across the room sharp, invisible zigzags of silver. Thank you, Amy Lowell. Uh, Billy Collins has a, an eating mise-en-scene, among others of his, around food. It's called Old Man Eating Alone in a Chinese Restaurant. I'm glad I resisted the temptation, if it was a temptation when I was young, to write a poem about an old man eating alone at a corner table in a Chinese restaurant. I would have gotten it all wrong, thinking... The poor bastard, not a friend in the world and with only a book for a companion. He'll probably pay the bill out of a change purse. So glad I waited all these decades to record how hot and sour the hot and sour soup is here at Chang's this afternoon and how cold the Chinese beer in a frosted glass. And my book, Jose Saramago's Blindness, as it turns out, is so absorbing that I look up from its escalating horrors only when I am stunned by one of his gleaming sentences. And I should mention the light that falls through the big windows this time of day, italicizing everything it touches, the plates and teapots, the immaculate tablecloths, as well as the soft brown hair of the waitress in the white blouse and short black skirt, the one who is smiling now as she bears a cup of rice and shredded beef with garlic to my favorite table in the corner. Thank you, Billy Collins, for that. I want to tell you a story about two men and baked Alaska. It's a vignette about my great-uncle Oscar and my grandfather, my father's father, who as partners ran a very large family textile business together back in time. This was told to me by my dear and long-gone Uncle Hugo, 
who I used to lunch with every week in Manhattan for decades. Very golden times, those lunches. One afternoon, he and I passed the site of the old Pennsylvania Railroad Hotel, which wasn't there anymore, but there was some other hotel there. Different building altogether, a structure put up. Well, he pointed up and said, there was a window right there in the original hotel and a table where my father, your grandfather, and Uncle Oscar used to take lunch together every day. They loved being together, even shared a secretary whose name was Miss Moth. Well, every day, he said, they always ordered dessert, the same dessert, nothing less than flaming baked Alaska, which listeners, as you may know, is a significant dessert, so the fact they eat that every working day is amazing. Well, I just love this story, the image of those old world gents tucking daily and gaily into their flaming baked Alaska, probably just love the flames among everything else. So uh, I was thinking, uh, you know, with an eye to memories uh, you have or may recall as, as you're listening in right now and unless we go along. Uh, I also love to touch on literary things and uh, stories and storytellers. And uh, there was certainly uh, a natural segue to ones like uh, Alexandre Dumas. Um, he said, assuredly, it is a great accomp accomplishment to be a novelist, but it is no meteoric or glory to be a cook. Well, Maria Popova in Brain Pickings tells us that although literary history remembers him, as the author of The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo, he was also, unbeknownst to many today, a formidable gastronome and masterful cook. And despite the 500 books he had authored, he considered the Dictionary of Cuisine his masterwork. Um, and in it, he said there were, he, he talked about three sorts of appetites. First, appetite that comes from hunger. It makes no fuss over the food that satisfies it. If it is great enough, a piece of raw meat will appease it as easily as a roasted pheasant or woodcock. Second, appetite aroused, hunger or no hunger, by a succulent dish appearing at the right moment, illustrating the proverb that hunger comes with eating. And third, one roused at the end of a meal when after normal hunger has been satisfied by the main courses and the guest is truly ready to rise without regret, a delicious dish holds him to the table with a final tempting of his sensuality. Thank you, Dumas. Um, I also had um, uh, come across, although my notes got a little mixed up in the kerfuffle around the, um, um, the uh, cutout of the... Uh, the streaming, uh, but there's a, um, a seducer's cookbook by Mimi Sheraton, and um, in it uh, she says, what makes the relationship between food and sex so compelling after all? Um, the urge to eat and the urge to procreate are basic, natural, and deliciously intertwined, and certainly no other method of seduction is as healthful or nourishing. No matter what else may go wrong, at least you've had a good meal. Um, I was... Uh, taken back to um, uh, Hemingway's uh, book, The Sun Also Rises, you know, and it was published in 1926. He was 27, and he, it was hailed as the quintessential novel of the lost generation, they were called, um, of which he was a part. And uh, his uh, very particular style came to the fore, very clip style. And he has this uh, passage, uh, it's the setting is Paris, uh, sp a food spiked passage that I liked. Uh, which begins in the morning, I walked down the boulevard to the Rue Soufflot for coffee and brioche. It was a fine morning. The horse chestnut trees in the Luxembourg gardens were in bloom. There was the pleasant early morning feeling of a hot day. I read the papers with the coffee and then smoked a cigarette. Well, in, um, excuse me, just a little, little water. Hmm. In, um, 2019, I created and co-hosted a wonderfully themed dinner called Making Our Hemming Way. And it was in, done in the quote, wilds of Williamsburg, of Brooklyn. And it was, uh, the menu was uh, riffing on actual recipes of his, uh, from his outdoor life. And I just wanted to tell you what some of the things were. It was, uh, I created a cocktail, um, an amateur mixologist, well, maybe more than amateur. And I made a whiskey hemmy, H-E-M-M-Y cocktail. Um, which with uh, warm and spiced uh, walnuts as uh, to nibble with and uh, on savory pancakes with feta figs and fresh rosemary roasted cornmeal and herb crusted butterflied somewhere over the rainbow trout 
with sautéed spinach and fingerlings, aged manchego, and crisp young Hudson Valley apples. Uh, there was also an apple pear and ginger bramble with sour cream, Ubuntu coffee and more whiskey, and many uh, poems and stories paired across the evening. And this was for a table of about a dozen Papa Hemingway enthusiasts who also brought their stories about him and why they loved him. Uh, I looked at lots of different cookbooks that I thought were great fun. One was the uh, Artist and Writer's Cookbook, which is a 1961 trove of interesting recipes and creative wit, illustrated 350 pages of artists by drawings by Duchamp and Robert Osborne and Alexandra Istrati. Um, uh, hundreds of recipes uh, that was contributed by painters, novelists, sculptors, poets, uh, Man Ray to Keats to Lars Durrell, Robert Graves, many others. A uh, lot of fun. You might want to uh, to check that out. And uh, I, I, among the many things in there was Burl Ives barbecue sauce, wild black honey, Turkish coffee, very thick, seven smashed garlic cloves, one jigger of sake. Have a, have a, have a peek at that. I also thought we should talk about uh, a little bit about different countries, cuisines or cultures, cuisines, and I went to the um, Uruguayan writer Eduardo Galeano uh, and his native cuisine, and he said, um, he said this about it. Uruguayans don't believe in vegetables. Their culinary religion worships the almighty cow, though in a more carnal way than their Indian counterparts. Markets bear signs saying carne y pollo, meat and chicken, because apparently chicken does not count as meat. In Uruguay, chicken is for vegetarians. Their main form of worship consists of asado, or gr grilled steaks. Gone is the clean air of American steakhouses. In its place is an ancient brick oven, heated by coals, sitting in the middle of the restaurant, spewing heat, smoke, and the scent of flesh into the air. These steaks are not painstakingly cooked to the even slightly brown, quote, manufactured doneness of America. No, in Uruguay, edges are blackened. Fat is blistered. The middle is less done than the edges, and sawed bones remain attached to sirloins. There is no desire for the, quote, perfect steak here. Their beloved asado is as perfect as the day it was created, probably around the times cows arrived here. Yeah, so uh, that brought to mind uh, that steakography or steakophilia <laughs> called this poem of mine to mine from a several-week poet in residency I did in Brooklyn back in 2016 in Cobble Hill. Uh, There's about this restaurant that I would always walk past. It's called Steaks and Chops are char-grilled here, behind the garish neon glow. Lunch and dinner, Italian cuisine, slightly softened by white lace curtains. At Sam's Place, a Court Street barnacle uh, since the 30s, the five families' salad days, by habitués, I'm told, of dubious and not salubrious kinds, meaning Brooklyn-bred mobsters with a bulge in their chests, unrelated to excessive ravioli eating. Large, dark-browned men, Nothing lacy about them, who hold court, always facing the front door, while Sam, cigarette affixed perpetually to his lower lip, still makes sure their steaks and chops are black and blue, never, God forbid, near overcooked. The um, image you see for uh, this uh, latest broadcast is, uh, by the way, from a five-course poetry on the plate immersive dining experience that I orchestrated for 24 people. It's called Table of the Gypsies, uh, quite, quite marvelous and memorable. And it was chefed by my beautiful Basque friend and soul sister, Ruth Guimara. And uh, so about the gypsies, you know, who go across many, many countries and have for hundreds of years, um, despite the many clans and subcultures, each with their own customs and dialects, Romani food culture as a whole shares a love of peppers, a love of bread, and strict rituals for cleanliness and table etiquette. Most revolve around the Romani belief that the world is divided into that which is, quote, pure and impure. All Roma avoid eating animals that are impure. They also shun eating horse meat because horses are so highly valued and respected. And in the Indian tradition, they further divide food into two categories, ordinary and auspicious or lucky, bashtalo. Auspicious foods are believed to be particularly healthy for the body and soul, and these beliefs are likely rooted in Ayurveda, the traditional Hindu system of medicine that uses food herbs and yogic breathing to balance the body. 
This includes food that is, quote, pungent or strongly flavored like garlic, lemon, pickles, peppers, sour cream, and so on. Most of all, Romani food culture is all about finding thrifty, resourceful, and delicious ways to nourish and purify the body, which is in part why their cuisine has been called, quote, the little-known soul food. But you'd find that interesting. All right, on we go. Um, there was some very curious uh, piece by uh, in Atlas Obscura, um, dot com, um that I came across about dictators who rule their country's cuisines, um, how authoritarian food obsessions can have a lasting legacy. So there were a couple here. Um, they started saying, it always surprises me that more people don't know that Pad Thai was invented by a dictator. I don't mean that the authoritarian prime minister of Thailand at the time got creative in the kitchen one day, but he made it, then an unknown noodle dish without a name, the country's national dish by fiat. Um, and in, in Cuba... To defy the United States, Fidel Castro built the world's greatest ice cream parlor, producing better ice cream than his capitalist enemy was meant to assert the superiority of socialism. <laughs> I've heard about that, actually, that ice cream parlor. I'd like to go there and try try the ice cream, see if it's really that great. But I, I've heard it is from friends who've gone. And um, there was a quote with uh, Witold uh, uh, Sablowski, who was a chef turned journalist and in 2020 he published How to Feed a Dictator, a book that tells the story of five chefs who worked for five terrible rulers and they asked him um, what he learned from them that you couldn't learn from anyone else. And he said, I have a theory that the only two people a dictator cannot lie to or manipulate are their doctor and chef and the chefs know everything. So he asked, they also asked him what similarities emerged across them all well, one, he said, came from the psychology of eating. When dictators have been in power for years, when they've tired of power or, or are scared of plots or attempts on their life, that's the moment when they miss mommy's kitchen. They all come back to what they ate as children. That's what surprised me the most. How about that? Um, there was a, a piece also there in Atlas Obscura about uh, the team that's resurrecting uh, ancient Rome's favorite condiment, so making umami inside 2,000-year-old ruins. Um, so in a sunny day in May, this was actually in this year, a dozen people met in the Roman ruins of Troia in what is now Portugal with a recipe. The ingredient list, 400 kilos of sardines, 150 kilos of sea salt, and 350 liters of seawater. The group included archaeologists, nutritionists, palynologists, uh, ichthyologists, and of course, one skilled chef to experimentally recreate Garum, the ancient fish sauce of the Roman Empire, just as it was originally produced. The group patiently gutted the small fish with crosscuts, threw them into ancient stone tanks, and covered them with brine made by combining the salt, seawater, and a met with a metal paint paddle. So they wanted to get the garum to the Portuguese diet, back to it. So the, um, the chef said, the rescue of this part of our history can reconnect us with the way we ate in this land centuries ago. And the project is the Garam Lusitano, or Portuguese Garam Project. How about that? Very, very interesting. Um, well, speaking of, uh, we were talking about Italy and R Rome and traditions. Um, back in Italia, um, one of my many sojourns there, I encountered the legendary uh, butcher Dario Cecchini. Um, talk about a wildly, almost cinematically like Fellini-esque, um, immersive experience. Um, this is the poem that speaks to that experience. Dario, il impresario, the master butcher, un maestro della macelleria, a man with the smile the size of Panzano, presides at an altar of stainless steel in a room chandeliered with magnificent meats and necklaces of red peppers, a white-tiled duomo of carne rosso, porco e palame accompanied by breast-swelling arias and clouds of spectators, beholding Cecchini the Great in his Balletto del Filetto, each move a choreography of carnivorous contemplation, marbled with conversation, laughter, and la vita. If you've never been there, I, maybe he's still there, I don't know, but uh, it's, it's worth a visit. Um... So much can happen, can't it, and unfold around a table of good food and good friends. It's timeless. It's universal, no matter your beliefs or culture. Um, 
This was from a favorite a trattoria in New York that I'd go to often with my uncle H, as I spoke of him earlier, and his, his partner, his life partner. Um, it was sort of a Dutch uncle. It's called The Corner Table. On a village hilltop north of Rome and south of home, a corner table is splashing like a fountain with sun. Mineral bubbles jump above the rim of the cold water glass I bring to my lips. Fruit and spice flow in a swallow of Sangiovese. Milky bliss from forkfuls of bufala mozzarella. The faces of Uncle H and S soft and aglow as we lounge over lunch and stories at the round, sun-gowned table. Yeah, so take yourself wherever to those moments where food, the taste of something or everything totally transported you. I've had so many of those moments, and uh, this was one at uh, a very special restaurant in Rome, La Rosetta. I was there in 1997, among other times, and uh, it's called Mangiare il Mare, eating the sea. Suddenly I'm eating the sea from a simple dish of linguine e scampi. I'm drinking the earth from a pale straw glass of Greco di Tufo, the sea and the earth meeting at a table in this city, where it's clear such things are eternal. And also those um, resonant times at the tables of people, um, people at their homes uh, where they're receiving us, and how they too can enchant and imprint us in very particular, very personal ways. This was one time uh, I was at... Uh, knew I hadn't really dined with them ever before. His, uh, some neighbors uh, invited us for dinner. He was the local butcher, very French, and um, said, come and sometime we have a partridge together. But uh, we didn't have a partridge, but we had quite a feast, and this is called the soirée. The succulent flavors of old world France lick our lips as we dance from the lift to the floor. Down the hall, the closed door of a white rabbit hole opens, to a starfish-eyed chanteuse and her escargot-nosed husband, Monsieur G, generously aproned in bonhomie. Glass balloons of vin rouge float over an old butcher's block. A pâté de campagne of conversation spreads itself out in the kitchen, cornichon by rustic tales of red-cheeked youth. We're led to a glass-top radiator for a fine pheasantless fete. More balloons of wine, more four-colored fables and bubbles of laughter, with Mozart and Piaf duets as our digestifs, before we skinny out the rabbit hole and farewell the bright, outlandish evening. I was thinking of things uh, further al fresco, because that's my favorite way to eat is outside, somehow. If I could do that 90% of the year, I'd be extra happy. Um, this is May Sarton's poem, Cold Lunch in the Garden. We sat having lunch in the garden, camellias in flower and pink viburnum, crocus, daffodils, and anemones on the ground like the border of a tapestry. And who were we? She is ninety-five now, he, her lover long ago, eighty-one, and I, the poet, who adored her, eighty. Fifty-five years ago he sent me a telegram. Oh, let my joys have some abiding. We sat in the spring garden on a chilly March day, and the joys all around us in the air, as elusive as the butterfly, came to rest for a moment on the table. Miracles do happen when you are old. Here's one from Greece uh, on an ancient island over a harbor in the Aegean. Alpha, by the way, refers to, of course, to both the beginning, Alpha Omega, and the local beer of that name, Alpha. From Alpha to Apollo. Cold Alpha. Fellini, Caruso, Di Stefano, Gavros with garlic, Ivor Novello, feta with oil, oregano, cicadas, ripe tomatoes, bread, olives, shadows, sun on brown terraced mountainsides. On a frisky note, I thought we'd have a little Charles Simic uh, poem, crazy about her shrimp. We don't even take time to come up for air. We keep our mouths full and busy eating bread and cheese and smooching in between. No sooner have we made love than we are back in the kitchen. While I chop the hot pepper, she grins at me and stirs the shrimp on the stove. How good the wine tastes that has run red out of a laughing mouth, down her chin and onto her naked breasts. I'm getting fat, she says, turning this way and that way before the mirror. I'm crazy about her shrimp, I shout to the gods above. Okay. A 
wanted to give you a little bit about the Futurist cookbook, but I am um, going to keep going because I want to stay on, still on time, even though we had that break. I, I think what happened is that we'll stitch that all together. So if you're, so if it's on a replay, it'll, maybe it'll just come all out whole again as as originally planned. Um, so I was talking about these um, poetry on the plate experiences I either um, put together myself and put out and invite people to, or I'm commissioned to do, and. Um, you know, it's all about the art and alchemy of cooking up an experience where, you know, it's around food and eating and the curation of guests as well and pairing um, foods, imagery, uh, visual written and spoken poetry, uh, anecdotes, and much else uh, to make something really quite um, unforgettable. And I, I call it a theming and pairing of tasteables, drinkables, scentables, touchables, seeables, and readables hearables and feelables so i think about it all and that's sort of what i work with uh, bring all those things weave all those things um, together uh another dinner that this poem led off was um it was called michelangelo's mouth and it was based on recipes drawn from a found grocery list that he wrote for his servant back in his day uh, that was uncovered in recent years and so this was uh, called a buonanotte buonarotti for uh, Michelangelo di Ludovico Buonarroti Simone, which was his full name. For now, for this moment, man of poetry, of deep-drawn beauty, made of marble, subtle inks, vibrant pigments, elements, figurements. By such seeing eyes, seeing hands, art made and eaten with the heart, evoked here with flowing cups of wine, grateful plates of festive food, night-sung song, as a celebration of you, Michelangelo. Your tastes, table, and the touchable spirit of Irascimento, ready to come alive again in many mouths, in marveling minds, in this hungry for transcendency world. Some of the most delicious things um, I've ever eaten were in Italy, um, although elsewhere, but especially in Italy, and uh, or things Italian, um, and especially, as I was saying, when eating fresco, the things seem to taste better. Um, this was an interlude, an intermezzo um, in Positano on the Amalfi Coast. And I took a little boat to this restaurant and swimming spot, which you can only get to by this little boat. It's called Vino Bianco con Pesce, white wine with fish. The vino locale arrives, fizzy, white, filled with peaches, mozzarella on lemon leaves, local fishes, orate, spigola, all grilled to blissfulness, the cold melon, a succulent kiss, full of dolce vita. We watch the sun from the shade, the silky bathers who bask and wade before we launch back the way we came. Okay. Um, just skipping along a little bit, I wanted to mention MFK Fisher, the great food writer, still very timely and uh, very well worth... Um, uh, experiencing or exploring, he wrote the following prescription for gastronomic perfection. Gastronomic perfection can be reached in these combinations. One person dining alone, usually upon a couch or a hillside. Two people, of no matter what sex or age, dining in a good restaurant. Six people, of no matter what sex or age, dining in a good home. Yeah. Visit her. She's worth visiting. Well, on my 59th birthday, I laid on a feast at a home. Uh, for wonderful friends who came to a beautiful and bountiful table in Cobble Hill to celebrate. It's called Brooklyn Meets Jerusalem. And Jerusalem refers to a um, Yotam Adolingi cookbook that I had uh, used as a sort of leaping off point to make uh, the main course. And uh, Brooklyn Meets Jerusalem at a table in a once German church, reverently last century Lutheran, now with a free-spirited mix of modern brethren, Three women, an Indian, a Malaysian, and one from Sweden. And three men from the high city, the green country, and one from Oz. A table of friends around a Middle Eastern dish of fresh roasted chicken, fennel bulbs, and clementines. White and red wines, eau de vie. Around stories, songs from a balcony, cakes, candles, and cobble hill calm. Around a poet's 59th year, bridging old and new worlds, histories, serendipities, blending the joys of here with dreams of next, embracing life wherever 
and however surprisingly it brings us. I had a few poems about picnics, but I want to scoot along. I'll give you one of the three of the tri triptych I had. This was in the Cyclades, and so with this temple of this um, one of the temples on this island. There were several different um, different ones. This was picnic among the ruins in Carthea, the, the uh, temple of Carthea and Caia, the Cyclades. Dark green sunglasses, bleach white kerchief to shield the neck from high burning sun, butterflies. Wild sage to mark and scent the way we descend down to a steep, a steep rough path to the re-rising ruins of Carthea. For a picnic, swim, and mouthfuls of Retzina below the pillars that templed Apollo and Athena eons ago. There's an, another book, um, it's not quite a cookbook, but it's the Antarctic book of cooking and cleaning. It was the extraordinary edible record of two women explorers journey to the end of the world in, in contemporary times and sort of um, sort of an, I don't want to say a revisit of um, Shackleton but uh, because no women were allowed to go at that time back then and so these uh, these women ventured out with uh, some others and uh, I liked what they had to say um, sort of as a summation of it uh, food is life food is culture it shaped old expeditions and shaped ours and we're going to use it to tell you the story. I also like to use, as some of you might, uh, metaphors when I'm telling stories about people that I know and love. And um, I had a few um, that I wanted to share with you, but again, I want to uh, just sort of come down toward the uh, toward the ending of things in a little short bit here. So I, I'll, I'll skip those, and we're gonna I'm gonna do one or two other parts to this program. So maybe I'll save these things. For then, but I'll give you just one of the three of these. It was uh, for my wonderful, one of my soul sisters, Rachel Menard, on her 48th birthday, when we sliced the cake. When we slice the cake of your life, a day, a decade, this year, we find generous layers of loveliness, adventurousness, industriousness. We taste a delicious way of being, a filling of jammy joie de vivre. We give thanks for getting to share in all the present and preceding courses, all the next great feasts, and most just desserts of you still to come. Okay. I would like to toast my host, uh, uh, one of you know the two, Roger and Irvy. This is for Roger Wu here in the Rogerium. Um, and um, his passion for cooking, feasting, tables of friends, and savoring. Uh, you'll find ancient Chinese ancestors, Readable tea leaves, hats of wool, of straw, for the sun, the rain, the moonlight, books that invite, evoke, provoke, a table for feasts, family, old friends, candlelit conversations, pork roasts, picnics, revels, and frolics, real and remembered, great South Bay clams, raked, revealed, generously shared and relished, a garden of fruits, blooming flowers, a beautiful woman ever blooming too. The laughter of children, the music of the sea, of air-free birds, whirling spheres, stars. A man with a heart of kindness, a spirit of joyfulness. A man steeped in the art of living, breathing life every day into his rare and most remarkable, unrepeatable Rogerium. So, as we wind toward the end now, uh, Wendell Berry has a poem, Prayer After Eating. I have taken in the light that quickened eye and leaf. May my brain be bright with praise of what I eat. In the brief blaze of motion and of thought, may I be worthy of my meat. Um, this is from My Last Supper, this book that I have with me by Melanie, uh, Melanie Dunea. Um, Fifty Great Chefs and Their Final Meals. And here's the preface by Anthony Bourdain as we... We come toward a close here. This is the last section of this. Chefs have been playing the My Last Supper game in one version or another since humans first gathered round the flames to cook. Whether late at night after the, their kitchens had closed, sitting at a wobbly table on the periphery of Les Halles in 19th century Paris and drinking vin ordinaire, or while nibbling bits of chicken from skewers and after our, hours um, izakayas in Tokyo, or perched at the darkened bar of a closed New York City restaurant, enjoyed 
enjoying pilfering vintages they couldn't otherwise afford, someone always piped up, if you were to die tomorrow, what single dish, what one mouthful of food from anywhere in the world or any time in your life would you choose as your last? What would be your choice for your last meal on earth? I played the game myself hundreds of times with my crew in Manhattan, line cooks in San Francisco and Portland, chefs from Sydney to Kuala Lumpur to Sao Paulo, and with many of the subjects in this book. It's remarkable how simple, rustic, and unpretentious most of their selections are. These are people who more often than not have dined widely and well. They know what a fresh white truffle tastes like. The finest beluga, for them, holds no mystery. So, here, here we have the, this is uh, the end now. I'll give you, th I'll give you the, th the three that I thought were my favorites, uh, sharings of their last meals, Jacques Pepin. The menu for my last meal would be eclectic, relaxed, informal, and would go on for a very, very long time. Years. I would eat all the things that I love in my, any order that I desired. I can't conceive of anything better than the greatest baguette, deep gold and nutty and crunchy, with a block of the sublime butter of Brittany and Belon oysters. I'd consume tons of the best beluga caviar with my wife, dispose of the best boiled ham and the most excellent Iberico ham. We'd eat eggs cooked in butter, scrambled, mole style, or sunny side up with the ham. Roast squab with the tiniest and freshest peas would be part of the menu along with a lobster roll and a perfect plump hot dog. I'd gobble down tiny finger-link potatoes just out of the ground and sautéed in goose fat along with a white escarole salad loaded with garlic and sprinkled with cracked pepper just like my mother used to make. I would devour aged Beaufort cheese that had a crystallized salted surface and fresh white farm cheese covered with thick creme fraiche seasoned with chives, garlic, and cracked pepper. I would enjoy my friend Claude's pâté of pheasant with black truffles and cognac and super thin slices of salted lardo and thin crusty farm bread covered with white truffles. I would eat roasted hazelnuts with bittersweet chocolate and the best apricots, cherries, and white and wine peaches just off the tree. I would pile homemade apricot jam onto thin buttery crepes hot from the pan and accompany them with a Bollinger Brut 1996 champagne. Wow, how about that? Here's a totally different one, next to last now. Uh, was the British chef uh, Fergus Henderson tells of his desired last meal on earth. The setting for the lunch, it would have to be lunch, is a Saturday in summer at home at the kitchen table, with the window wide open so you can hear the busy street below. I would prepare the lunch for family and friends. To start, we would have many platters of sea urchins washed down with muscadet, then a pre-cheese cigarette, excellent red burgundy, and goat cheese, followed by one scoop each of dark butter chocolate ice cream. We'd finish with strong coffee, much vieille prune, and more cigarettes. Then, there can be music and drunken dancing to Wilson Pickett. That should help soften the blow. And above all of them is this one to close. Uh, this is uh, the uh, chef Eric Ripper. His last meal on earth, it would be a simple dish, a slice of toasted country bread, some olive oil, shaved black truffle, rock salt, and black pepper. What would be the setting for the meal? It would be under a very big oak tree or banyan tree. What would you drink with your meal? Tequila? I'm just kidding. I'd have a great bottle of red Bordeaux. Would there be music? The sounds of nature would be enough. The wind moving through the branches and maybe the sound of the birds. Who would be your dining companions? I would like to be surrounded by the people I love. Who would prepare the meal? It is a very simple and amazing meal. I would like to prepare it myself for the pleasure of doing so. One last time. Thank you again for listening in, floating, tasting, and I hope feeling in. And continued thanks to all of you listening regularly and to those letting me know by text and email how the programs touch you. I'm always delighted to hear from you, especially as a great deal of what I create and present is meant to nourish spirits, uplift hearts, and spur greater self-awareness and aliveness. And it's rewarding to realize how much these offerings do speak to you. If you love this or another program and want to support the larger arc uh, of my poetic arts, uh, you can donate by PayPal or Venmo or directly through my site or by mail to me, P.O. Box 1032, Westerly, Rhode Island, 02891. Any patrons interested in hosting me on a part of their property as a working poet in residence for several weeks or more, later this summer, fall, or winter, where I would bring forth a flight of poetic art and dedicate it to you, I'd welcome a conversation. 
I also seek out simpatico fellow artists to collaborate with on projects from the musical to the theatrical, and producers, directors, or others wanting a deeply poetic voice and spirit. All the live broadcasts are online as replays in one floating poetry playlist on YouTube. I hope you'll lean in again next week, or soon again. Until then, dear listeners, here's to engaging, relishing, and celebrating today and often your own love or appreciation of food, cooking or feasting, or all of those things, all the delicious experiences around them that infuse and enrich your and our lives, our bodies, feelings, moments, and memories. Goodbye for now, and good spirits.